Joining me live is constitutional law expert with UNSW, Professor Rosalind Dixon. Thanks very much for your time. So, looking first of all, legal legality, from what we know so far, the issue for Scott Morrison, is it mainly one of possibly misleading Parliament? Uh, is there anything else he should be worried about? I think, Tom, at this point, you know, he's no longer the Prime Minister. I think he should be worried about a censure motion in Parliament and the fact that the people um, of Australia have lost confidence in him. But in terms of strict legality, I think he's in relatively safe territory. But his actions, um, as I think your question suggests, really raise serious constitutional questions. So, so let's go to them then and, and talk about uh, um, both him and the Governor-General role. As simply as possible, I guess, um, for people that are not experts such as yourself, the Governor-General takes orders or instructions from the First Minister, that's Scott Morrison as Prime Minister, so there's the legal side, but also um, while he's required to act within the Constitution, um, how does that sort of marry up with what's happened here? So he gets directions from the PM, but also required always to act within the Constitution. Yeah, and his constitutional responsibility is to take the advice of government, but his duty, not just his right, his duty under the Constitution is to advise, counsel and warn. And if you've ever watched series uh, of The Crown, you know that the Queen has exercised that responsibility quite robustly at various times. And my argument has been that the Governor-General needs to explain how he discharged that duty. Did he have any information from the Prime Minister's office that these would be overlapping appointments? Did he ask questions about why these appointments were necessary in the mind of the Prime Minister and why they were made? So ultimately he had to accept the request from the Prime Minister, but he could pause that request and ask for more information and more justification. And we have no basis for thinking that he did that. And in my view, and unless and until the Governor-General explains how and why he did that, or that he had absolutely no idea of the arrangements, he must actually think about his own position and whether he can continue to maintain the confidence of the Australian people in his capacity to uphold the Constitution. So the Governor-General released a statement as to his role saying, and this is a quote, he had no reason to believe that the new powers or arrangements would not be made public. But there were more, you know, there was the initial swearing in and then more ministries added a year later. Is that something, crucially, we need an explanation on, that if initially he'd had this process happen plenty of times, new ministries added, whatever it might be, um, and he thought, well, of course, they'll be made public. I wouldn't ask. I don't need to. I didn't before. I won't this time. But he should have been keeping an eye on that. And a year later, when more requests were made, he should have queried why the previous ones weren't and whether these ones would be made public. Exactly, Tom. And I mean, I think we also need to be really clear about what we mean by public. There's public to us, in which case, you know, there would have been pretty strong alarm bells going off for most people that a year later there was no um, publicity, although it's pretty complicated sometimes how these things are disclosed. But I think the real question is, if you're overlapping in your appointments, you need to be sure that that overlap has been uh, dealt with appropriately and he needed to be sure that the relevant ministers were informed. And that's not public in the sense that you and I knew about it, but, you okay. know, Frydenberg and Pitt needed to know about it. And that's what's really absolutely bemusing to people is that he would make provision for himself to exercise residual power without talking to or communicating with the primary decision maker in ways that raise really obvious accountability problems. So it's not enough for the Governor General to say, oh, I assumed but didn't know they wouldn't be made public. He needed to make sure that if he was making a commission that overlapped with an existing commission, he was satisfied that that overlap was properly structured in ways that would um, be consistent with accountability. So I think the Governor General, unfortunately, has many questions that still have to be answered before we can be satisfied mm. that he has discharged his obligations. We should add, of course, these are the statements so far. So he hasn't um, confirmed one way or the other some of the questions no. you asked there. But no, no we need so, to so, answer. It's yeah. not that we know the answer. We just right. need to find out what happened. And this is the other interesting element. So you mentioned duty. So on one hand, there's what he has to do to follow the Constitution. So similar to the Prime Minister, you're not saying anything here hasn't been done along the, the legal lines, but we get to his duties. So where exactly does that fit in? Is this somewhat of a grey area? Is it up to him to suggest to the Prime Minister this should be made public? 
for him to suggest that ministers should know, for him to tell the Prime Minister that should happen, that that's convention, and if the Prime Minister says, I'm not going to do that, what then? Is, is this a grey area as to the exact duties there and how hard you push? I think grey area might capture it. It's certainly a hard balance because you've got to follow the instructions of the government, but you are entitled and required to ask questions that ensure good government according to the Constitution. And I just want to emphasise that the most important issue was not publicity, it was overlap. If the Governor-General was aware of the overlap, mm. in my view, he could not grant a commission con consistent with the Constitution unless and until he was satisfied about how the overlap would be dealt with. We are not aware of previously overlapping commissions of this kind. They okay. raise serious constitutional questions and that needed to be addressed. And does, does this highlight somewhat as well the, the role of the Governor-General? I mean, we always have this debate around, around the public. Well, what, what are we going to do with the system? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But actually we have such a crucial role that is still somewhat subjective because people can have views on how duty should be carried out. Well, unfortunately, Tom, I don't think subjectivity is avoidable because we give um, a power that is discretionary and judgment-based to the Governor-General. But I think if the Governor-General is unwilling to exercise that power in a way that upholds the Constitution, uh, we should be asking questions about his particular, uh, you know, office and the responsibility we've given him. But more important, as you say, about Republic and broader reforms that might allow for some degree of codification, but also someone who feels that they have the public's mandate uh, behind them to exercise appropriate constitutional oversight of the government of the day. So the biggest reform is we just need the people under the current system to do their job properly and to explain to us how and why they did that. But if and they can't do that or they won't, then I do think many people are going to say, well, maybe it is a bit broke and maybe we need an elected, albeit indirectly elected president who's willing and able to discharge this constitutional responsibility. Yeah, which brings us to a whole other debate. We won't get into that today, but uh, it is certainly food for thought. There are a lot of people pressing for more explanation, at the very least, just so we know exactly what happened. Professor Rosalind Dixon, thanks for your time. Thanks, Tom.